My name is Julian Guthrie. For those of you who don't know, I am your host today. And I'm so honored to bring together this incredible group of um, amazingly talented individuals and amazingly talented women. Um, a little bit quickly about myself. I am the founder of the Alpha Girls Institute, which is a nonprofit, and it's aimed at uh, enabling, supporting, promoting women and girls to succeed in male-dominated industries. I am founding my first uh, startup, which is in stealth mode, and I am the author of four nonfiction books, and it was Alpha Girls, um, this book right here, that really changed my way of looking at the world and I think led me to this moment where we are today. It showed me where women are and where women are not and where we should be, and it really got me hooked on just finding incredible women and telling their stories. And there is so much power in sharing our stories and creating this network of women and of great allies. So for the men who are out there, we welcome you as well and we need you to be great allies. So the women who are a part of this today um, are doctors, mothers, uh, therapists, CEOs, founders, uh, moms, and just a really interesting group. And we're all, you know, we're going to focus on stories of transformation, uh, stories of coping, <laughs> stories of staying sane, and stories of trying to um, make ourselves and our worlds a little bit better even during these challenging times. So I wanna kick off, we have special musical guests, uh, Lindsay White and Jewel Stewart, and they are amazing. Um, so they are going to kick off with a really fun uh, pandemic themed parody uh, of Shake It Off. So I will, I will hand it over to you two, such talented musicians. Thank you. Thank you for having us here today. And my name is Lindsay White. It's my best friend and my drummer, Jewel Stewart. Um, we're both actually really involved in this uh, collective called Lady Brain Presents, and we help local um, creative women identifying people here in San Diego give them support, resources, and all that stuff. So we're really proud to be here today. And um, here's a silly song for you. Thank 
you so much for having us. You're amazing. And so if anyone wants to um, hire them for your house parties, for your events, we'll send out their info. They're both on Venmo as well. Um, support our creative people, our amazing musicians. Lindsay and Jules, it was an honor and thank you for being here. Thank you, friends. Thank you again, beautiful. beautiful. So we are also, I wanted to mention up front here, we, there's a mission here and that is, uh, we're doing this in partnership with the Ronald McDonald House Charities of San Diego and they pro provide care to uh, families and children uh, in need year round. And so we also, also will have a donation um, link which is up on Alpha Girls Global where you can contribute and uh, Brandy, uh, I think you, you, you're, uh, this whole group is so amazing. So I'd like to start out uh, with um, all of you, all of the panelists, introducing yourselves quickly, and then we're going to get into just a great discussion. So Brandy, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. What an honor. And um, Lindsay and Joel, that was so much fun. Um, so I'm Brandy Bullen. I'm the CEO and founder of Sequoia Consulting. Um, and more importantly, I am the mother of three small children, um, all girls, a 10 year old, a just turned nine year old and a four year old. And I'm just thrilled to be here. And Brandy, your company, um, going back to Ronald McDonald, um, your company has done something really wonderful. You're on the board of the Ronald McDonald House Charities. And I heard through a little grapevine that your company will match the donations up to $5,000 that are made, correct? Absolutely. Um, and so everybody who can, we would love to match every dollar that you donate. Thank you. That's amazing. Okay, so let's go down the line and uh, you all continue to introduce yourselves uh, here al alphabetically. Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Ciel. I'm CEO and founder of 9Q, a company that really strives to provide scalable, integrated solutions to human challenges uh, in our organizations, any organization. I have spent some time in school. I have a master's and doctorate in clinical psychology. I have an undergraduate degree in economics and am just finishing up my master's in business. So I would say I'm also just a human being who feels the struggle and feels the challenges in the world. And I'm constantly curious about looking for ways to make things a little bit better. And I'm really excited about talking a little bit more about what that, what that looks like, the power of being present and looking for opportunities even when times are challenging. Thank you. Chrissy, say hello to the world. Yeah, hello world. <laughs> I'm Chrissy Powers. I am a mom to three kids. Um, Waylon, Zeke, and Ruby, wife, um, just Sam. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, also blogger at ChrissyPowers.com. I have my own podcast called Sure Babe, where we talk about marriage, motherhood, and career. And I am an online coach, and I love to help coach women find their voice, package up their passion, profit from it, and also um, release trauma from their bodies. We're going to come back to that because I thought that was really interesting. Um, just this issue we talked about, you and I talked about, Chrissy, with releasing trauma. And we all have trauma. It's by degree, but we'll come back to that. So Sasha, um, superstar um, as well, please say hello to everyone. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Dr. Sasha Shilkut, and I am a cardiac anesthesiologist by day and sometimes night. <laughs> um, and I am the founder of Brave Enough, which is an organization to empower women to invest in themselves uh, and to really prevent burnout, especially amongst women physicians. So I lead a group of about 12,000 women doctors. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm typically on the sideline cheering for one of my four children in some capacity. So let's, um, Sasha, let's start with some questions here. And um, you told me earlier this week of how intense, you know, your job um, is under COVID. And we all have images of what doctors are going through and and, and nurses and all of those heroes on the front line. But you told me something that I had never, I, that I hadn't thought of, and that is 
you know, you're working with cardiac patients and kind of the extra role that you have had to step into um, that was so touching to me. So just talk about that a little bit, what it's like, the pressure, the anxieties, and then this added role um, that doctors have today because families are not comfortable being in the hospital or not allowed. Yeah, so, you know, besides all of the uh, clinical implications of COVID and the pandemic and now learning how to care for patients with a new disease, uh, one of the things that we're also faced with, and I, I think it's really specifically to women physicians and women nurses and women in healthcare, um, is all of our patients are alone uh, in the hospital. And that's something very new to us and new to medicine. Um, and so because of the them having to be by themselves and recover from either surgery or even hear a diagnosis by themselves, we find ourselves stepping up emotionally to be that family member um, and to be at the bedside. And it, it's a lot. <laughs> and I don't think any of us really thought about that or thought of the implications of that. And I found myself at times coming home after a long day thinking like I'm just totally empty because I, I didn't just have to be the anesthesiologist. I had to be the person that was holding a hand and trying to, you know, pray with the patient or, you know, calm the patient down and tell him like, I'm going to be there with you the whole time. I'm going to take care of you. Of course, I always want that message to come across, but I think, you know, as physicians, as nurses, everyone around the patient, I think we're finding ourselves having to be more than just the, the medical team. Uh, we're really having to be the emotional support of the patients as well. And so each of you um, of the panelists, please jump in and talk about, you know, how it is similar for you in terms of this magnified um, pressure, whether it's at home with your kids, with your spouse, with your partner, whether it's trying to accomplish something, whether it is Brandy managing, you know, 90 people and having, you know, kids at home at the same time. So just go ahead and, and jump in here and talk about whether it's the trauma, whether it's the self-care, whether just the added pressure right now and how you're coping. One more thing I'd add is that this, where we are right now, um, this recession or this economic collapse of the moment is being called a she session instead of a recession because women are disproportionately affected. In April, the majority of job losses were by women. Uh, the unemployment rate for women uh, is now in the double digits, which it hasn't been since 1948. So this is really serious and we're all affected in different ways. So please share your stories. <laughs> I'm still stuck. I'm just still stuck with what Sasha was talking about because I used to spend so much time working with physicians and nurses in hospital settings when really challenging things would happen. And I w I've been thinking about how lonely it must be not only for the patient, but for those who are serving the patients. Um, it's really unfortunate because having, having that extra support allows you to be able to be there for the patient. Um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and our company is relatively young. And, you know, someone asked me the other day, what's your day-to-day -day look like? And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm working all the time. You know, that, that part hasn't changed. It's just where the focus is, has changed. And, and the, you know, economically, there are stressors that are there now that were not there a few months ago. And, and so, you know, that and managing, I also have a few, a few kids. I have one, my daughter is graduating from high school and just managing that at the same time and, and watching her go through the process of being told <laughs> that she's in this special graduating class because they're part of history. And it, 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 it's not exactly what she, what she needs to hear, but um, you know, I'm fortunate that I, I work virtually a lot. So the virtual part of it has been probably easier for me than it has been for others. But, but for our clients, what I'm noticing is that the organizations, the leaders who have had the, the foresight, who have been proactive in, in, in training themselves and setting themselves up are really weathering this much better. They're able to pause and think about how can I shift and change and turn this into an opportunity? 
Whereas those who were maybe on brink of working with us and, and thought that things like leadership and culture and taking care of your people should stay, you know, for something to do later, they're really being rocked by, by this. They're being forced to recognize that that people do matter, how you run a business matters, and, and there are so many different things that are, they're pressures, but they're also opportunities for us. Well, Laura, you had told me that you, you know, have, have worked with patients end of life, and, yeah. and, you know, and to turn to something positive, and I want to hear uh, from Chrissy and Brandy, you know, you had told me that there, there are moments of just beauty and, um, power in even the darkest moments that you have experienced with these patients. And I just can't uh, just mention, you know, just touch on that for a moment. Yeah, I was going to say I've had to just get a little bit more creative. Um, I'm a creative entrepreneur as well. So um, I, at the beginning of the quarantine, was getting ready to go into my second um third launch for my course, my program, Find Your Voice. And immediately it was like, oh, do we do this? Like, do I ask people for money? I mean, I have to make money myself. And so I was kind of like, what do I do? And so I kind of researched and I felt like um, it's a disservice to myself and to others to not charge um, for your services at the time. So what we did was we got really creative in terms of like, how can we make this affordable for people? Um, and so we lowered the price and extended the pay period. And we got the, I, I got the best group of women that are invested in themselves and their lives right now. And it created this sort of community. We meet twice a week on Zoom and we do live coaching and we walk them through the course and it's been beautiful to create this community of women that are like using this time to pivot, maybe because they have to, like one of them worked at a restaurant and now doesn't have that job. Um, one, you know, a few of them are like, okay, I really now have to do what I want to do. You know, I want to be this photographer. I want to do, you know, open up my own online vintage clothing shop or uh, whatever it is. It was like, it was really great to get creative and I'm so glad that I didn't just close the doors on it and say it's insensitive to promote myself or my product right now because if I didn't do that I wouldn't have created this community of like-minded women that are all supporting each other through this time so I find so much beauty in being creative and pivoting and kind of rolling with it daily yeah I love that and I'm going to come back to I want to talk about um, trauma Brandy, you told me a story of what you consider like um, um, a victorious day, these little, you know, moments where you can, where you, you know, get dressed and it speaks to self-care. So um, talk a little bit about all that you're juggling and how it's, how it's going for you and any kind of takeaways that, that we may get from you. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I'll be the first to admit when, you know, when, when all of this went down, I, I panicked and, and I... I don't feel like I did a great job coming out of the gates, you know, on this being a leader and being a, um, juggling all of these new hats that I had to juggle. Um, you know, I, I completely melted. Um, and I don't feel like I approached it very well. I feel like I'm getting better. Um, but that took some time, you know, it, it took two weeks to realize that every single day I got to get up. I got to take a shower. I got to put on a bra and I've got to lead this company still. And I've got to do it. And with, you know, humility and, and vulnerability and, and, you know, it was, my job's always been about unity and about, um, being there for people and, and leading with, you know, love. But what I realized, it's even more important for those, those to come out in my day to day. And then I've got to bring that home and bring it to, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm a full-time chef and a full-time teacher, which by the way, that job is great. Um, and I've got to have conference calls with babies hanging on my, my limbs and, and not lose my cool. And, um, and I don't always do that and I'm not always good at it, but you know, 
I am having moments of, you know, success and that's, that's feeling good. Um, so we have to treasure that and we got to hold on to it. And I got to keep remembering that maybe I'm not the best teacher, um, but I'm still a good mom and I'm still a good employee and a good CEO. Um, and we all have our moments. Um, you know, the importance of self care. And I want to touch on that. Like, like Brandy, you also told me that, you know, going for a 30 minute walk is kind of your self care. And so each of you, you know, maybe offer up how, Sasha, when you get home from a 24 hour shift or whatever it is, and you are completely depleted, what do you do? And this applies to all of you because we're all being asked to do so many things right now. So Sasha, what, how do you get restored? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, and I want to say, I think no matter what your job is right now, it's hard uh, mm -hmm. because our home has, has, is not the cushion it once was, right? And so I think that that's really a struggle for most of us. And I think it's not like we left all of our expectations at work. Like we come home and now there's more expectations. One of the things that I have learned about myself is that when I walk in the door, uh, sometimes I call it frozen car syndrome. Like I don't want to get out of the car because <laughs> I'm like, oh gosh, I'm going to open the door and I'm going to get like the million questions and like we're out of milk and someone hit me and like what's for dinner. And so um, my kids, I've taught them this about me that when I come home, I literally go to when I'm having those days, I go to my closet, I put on a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt. And I do a 30 minute like walk. Sometimes it's 15 minutes. Sometimes I just walk to the end of my lane and back like five times. And they're like, mom's walking. She'll come in and she'll be better. And I am like, I have a, I have to have like a mindfulness 15 minutes where I decompress uh, from the day. And I, I really kind of process it before I project it on everybody else. Um, and I had to teach my kids that because there was a huge part of me that was thinking like, oh my gosh, I've been away from them for 12 hours. And the last thing that they want me to do is to leave them for 15 minutes and, and walk. But I have to do that in the winter. I just go to my room and they know like I'm shutting my door. I need 15 minutes to decompress before I emerge um, for my second job. Um, or, and, and I think that we all have to give ourselves grace right now, whatever that looks like for, for you, because it is, it doesn't matter if you are a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor or a founder or an entrepreneur, this is hard. <laughs> and so how we process and how we take care of ourselves, I think mentally is so, it's so important. And just extending that hand of grace, like you would to your best friend, extend it to yourself. I like what you said, Sasha, because one of the things that I see is, um, and women seem to do this more than men. I mean, I think men probably do it too, but it, it just, it jumps out more. And that is thinking that there's, that you have to jump right into the next role, the next thing, right? And that somehow you're less than, there's always that kind of critical thing. Like if I, oh, I'm home and I'm not with my kids, I'm doing it wrong. Or, you know, that, that kind of, oh, but I'm, I'm doing this. I'm taking, trying to set things up for tomorrow, but they need me in the kitchen, whatever it is. And having that, you know, we need to let go of, we need to let go of what it's supposed to look like and really listen to what we need in order to show up as our best, as our best in that particular moment, not as the best as, you know, as defined by someone else. And it's different every day. I mean, it depends. It depends on if you're feeling well or not. It depends on what's happened at work. It depends on what's going on with the kids. And it's so important to just ask, what do I need now in order to be able to show up? as what you know when whatever that whatever that is um chrissy i was intrigued by what you said about trauma and i want to go back to that because people think of trauma as oh you're in a car accident it's something traumatic it's something very big but you have a different def definition of trauma and a way to actually work through where people can work through trauma talk a little bit about that yeah um Hopefully you can hear me. Let me know if my sound isn't mu is muffled. <laughs> um, trauma for me is just the definition is the stuff that happens to you. And you can exit out stuff and put whatever expletive you want <laughs> to put in there. Um, so 
yeah, trauma can be a, an accident, uh, abuse. It can also be things you didn't get that you needed as a child. Um, so there really is no definition of, of trauma. We all have it. Um, I, I learned on this journey, of, you know, probably now um, seven years ago uh, from a traumatic event that happened um, to me and realized two years later that I had some PTSD symptoms from that. And that really got me on this path of, you know, going back to therapy and trying out different methods. And um, there's so much out there that can help you with trauma, but it led me to find this particular therapy called nonlinear movement. Um, where you really do learn that trauma is not just in my mind, it's in my body. And I had been frozen for a long time and I had kept that energy. Um, but what happens when you go into flight, fight or flight, if you don't expel that energy, um, it's called immobilization and it gets lodged in your body. And so I had so much stored traumatic energy in my body that I was physically changed as a person. And so the great thing about our bodies is they can... Um, our bodies and our minds, you know, can grow and adapt and change and our minds are neuroplastic so we can grow new neurons. And I, I love that so much. So doing this therapy of moving my body um, and it's almost like this movement and meditation put together um, really has helped my body and my nervous system restabilize. So I think it's so timely now that I, I literally just finished getting my certi certification in it. Um, so I'm adding that to my practice and to my programs where I walk women and men, anyone, actually I do it with my kids um, through moving their body and, and their emotions. Um, so I tell people all the time, like move with what you feel. If that's coming up, like even if you don't have a yoga mat and you can't do a whole nonlinear session, put some music on. If you're triggered by something that you just saw on the news, put some music on and start a dance party in your kitchen with your family. And that's what we've done. And it's helped us so much through some of those hard moments. I love that. You know, I had a walk with a dear friend of mine, um, Jill, who I think is on today as an attendee. And we were talking about how heavy it, this uncertainty is and how we're so unaccustomed to uncertainty. You know, we're used to, we love our routines, right? And everything, you know, Sasha was talking about how everything in medicine is protocolized and it's regimented. And now our world, all of us, you know, is just, everything is new and nothing. We want to go back and we're not going to be able to go back. And just how to accomplish things in this time of uncertainty, because it's this anxiety that's so, you know, kind of oppressive for so many people. So I'd like you all to, weigh in where you have you know ideas on how to um, cope with the unknown which is really hard for us as human beings right we try to figure things out and then how to um, you know push toward um, accomplishing things during this time of uncertainty well you know it's a really different skill set and i think being in this experience or experiment, you can look at it that way that we're all in, it's we're realizing that maybe some of the skills, some of the things that we thought were really helpful before they're falling to pieces. So it's, it's a, it, it requires pausing long enough to take assessment of how we're approaching, how we view things, how aware we are of how we show up, how we think, and, and then being open to the fact that we can we have we have the ability we have the power to change that and to change it not to make everything perfect but to change it and and learn and grow in ways that maybe maybe on some way other level this is what's being asked for right now is for us to stop and let go of the things that didn't serve us up until now and to open up to those things that maybe we you know one of the things i've noticed is women leaders who, who are our clients are saying that they're being recognized right now for skill sets that in the past they've kind of hidden. And the world is needing, for example, more empathy, more connection, more ability to really relate to another person and, and have a deeper, you know, a deeper, more meaningful. And I, I think to me, there are a lot of hard things, but there's something really exciting about that 
because it's hard to change that when you're one person or a couple people, but the entire, the entire planet's being asked to stop and shift. And, you know, I noticed one of the, one of the attendees had asked, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you get what you need and how do you do this when, you know, maybe the world around you isn't, isn't responding the way you want. And I think that the, the opportunity to decrease our anxiety and to have calm and have the presence to be able to look at where we are and look where we want to go. It's an inward process. And we're so used to relying on an external, external, you know, people's words or, you know, uh, great letter grades or whatever it is. And it's a, it's a time to really go internal and, and learn to trust ourselves again. And that doesn't mean that we have control but it means that we trust that we can navigate as imperfectly as we do because no one's going to do it perfectly, but we trust ourselves that we can then shift and change if something's not working out. I loved what you said um, to me. You said you can't sit around and wait. Like this is going to happen to <laughs> Yeah, I think too often you just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just, you know, it's, it's common. It's, you know, we all do it to a certain extent. It's just, you know, let's increase our awareness of how often we're doing it. it. We're waiting for other people to come save us, to make us feel better, to do something so that we're not anxious, to do something to try to con make something permanent or under control. And, and that's a very uncomfortable position to be in because then you're just waiting for something or someone else. You said it's all within light and dark. So speaking of that, um, Brandy, you told me a really powerful story about your daughter and being in the hospital for one year, sleeping in her room for a year. Uh, she couldn't go outside for, I think, the first 18 months of her life. And, and kind of what that taught you. And then also because we are you know, bringing attention to the work of the Ronald McDonald House, kind of what role that they played. So so if you could share that really powerful story. Yeah, so, you know, my youngest child, um, and I've been thinking about this more now than I've been, I've thought about it in, in years, because I think it's very relevant to right now, um, because it prepared me for this. Um, so my youngest was born with a, with a health issue, and, and she was in the hospital for quite some time and had multiple surgeries. And it was a, a, a very hard time for my whole family. And during the moment, watching my other daughters um, go through that with her and cry for her and feel for her, I, I remember feeling so overwhelmed and so guilty that they had to go through that. Um, and not understanding why life would do that, right? Um, but now looking back on it and looking back at, at those years of struggle and pain, I see inside my children something that you can't teach. And my older daughter has more empathy than most children. And I know it's because of that. And my family is stronger because of the, what we went through. And I'm proud of that. And they're proud of that. And that makes it easier to help other people through this time. And, and during that time, I learned how to ask for help. Um, I learned how to deep compartmentalize and put things in perspective. Um, and I think all of those, those tools were needed to deal with today. Um, during that time when I was living at the hospital for, for quite some time, it wasn't a year, it, you know, I was in and out of hospitals. Um, I found the Ronald McDonald house and I didn't stay at the Ronald McDonald house. Um, I just went there to use the shower and, um, that was huge. Um, and I didn't take a whole lot of showers when I was there, but when I did, I used it as the place where I cried. Um, you can't cry in the, oh, sorry. You can't cry in front of your kids when they're sick. You need to be strong for them. So it gave me a place to go to 
to be able to cry. And that was very healing. And then I would come back way stronger. And that was really important. And that's why I do so much for the Ronald McDonald House. They give parents an opportunity to stay with their children. They give parents an opportunity to have a network to go cry with. Um, it's it's families dealing with the same thing, maybe in a different way, um, but dealing with the same struggles. And that unity is what is, again, connecting us today. Um, what we have today is for the first time that, that I think I can ever remember, the world is unified in the same struggle. And again, it's everyone struggling in a different way, but this is touching everybody. It was such a powerful thing that you shared. Um, Sasha, so Sasha is, in addition to being, you know, extraordinarily talented um, in her medical profession, she is an author and she's the founder of Brave Enough. And I want to read something that, um, that you wrote that I found really beautiful. We have to step out of the shadows and share our truth. We have to be brave but not overwhelmingly brave, just brave enough. There is significance in describing the experiences we face as women. So set the scene for that. How do, what does that mean to you? Well, I write that because I think that, um, you know, we all want to be our best self or our authentic self or whatever that is for you. Um, but the reality is that our real life is messy and it's imperfect and we struggle and we have the moments where we're crying in the shower and we can't tell anybody. And I think that just showing up every day authentically who you are and being real and being vulnerable as a leader, as a woman, that's, that takes immense courage <laughs> just to get up every morning and show up as yourself. And so, you know, through this entire thing, at first I kind of went into like, leader protector mode and i wanted to huddle everybody together and protect everybody and be like the you know like joan of arc and then i realized like that's i'm not going to make it to the end of this if i yep. if i come out of the dugout like that and so i have to step out of the shadows but part of stepping out of the shadows is being real and being vulnerable and i loved what brandy said how she said you know at first i didn't handle this really well i didn't handle it well, either because I was trying to be the hero and like take care of everything. And I recognized at one point, because I lead so many women doctors who are on the front lines, that that's not what they needed me to do. What they needed is somebody to encourage them to be authentic and to say, you know, I'm having a really hard day today. I don't know how to teach a third grader math problems. And he was crying. I was crying. I don't like this. I'm struggling. Um, or I had a really hard day yesterday at work and I'm, I, I came home in tears. That's what they want to see. They want to see the real person that's still just like them to normalize the experiences that they're going through. And so, you know, two things that have stuck with me that I think about almost every day is I'm trying to go through my day with open hands, which is hard for me because I tend to think I can do everything and have a task list. I'm very, you know, action oriented, but I need help. And so I'm trying to go through every day, holding my hands open and accepting help from other people. And the other thing that I'm trying to do is to help the people in my view. So I keep thinking like whoever's in front of you, just show kindness, be, be more resilient than you normally were, be quick to uh, listen and slow to speak, which is not, doesn't come natural to me. <laughs> and you can't help everybody, but you can help whoever's in front of you today, Sasha. So I'm trying to be the leader that just shows that I don't have it all together. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm having hard days. Um, but I also want to encourage women to just be brave enough for today. That, that, that alone is, is winning. If you just show up today. That's really beautiful. Um, you also talked about the loneliness of, um, and I found this with my reporting about, you know, the women who are working in tech and the women who are working in these really male dominated industries. I want to touch on that for a moment um, because it's such a powerful thing and it brings us to this network of women. Mm -hmm. And that is you felt very alone. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people who your role models, they were men. 
And so you were emulating men and you got to this really low point in your career, even though you were at a superstar level where you felt very isolated and alone. And you also made a comment um, about lipstick and maybe there's a progression from like that low point to where you are today. Yeah, so it's interesting because um, I really wanted to succeed in my career when I when I started in medicine, you know, I I worked so hard to get there. And so all of my leaders, all of my mentors and sponsors were men. And I was like, I got to be like that, you know, and it brought me a lot of success on paper, but it brought me such isolation and loneliness because I started withdrawing from women thinking I don't want to be associated with like the, the women over here or these women. I got to be, you know, really tough and never show emotion and it led me to such profound isolation that I wanted to quit medicine about five or six years ago. And the only way that I put myself kind of back together was through community with other women. And that's why I love doing things like this and meeting all of you because, um, you know, when you're, in, when you're an entrepreneur or you're leading or you're just trying to do anything new as a woman, it's, it can be really easy to withdraw and not show your yeah. insecurities or your vulnerabilities. But we so need one another. Um, and now I, I can tell you that I have such a great support system being who I am, not trying to emulate a man because I'm not, I'm never going to be a man. So I, I need to embrace who I am as a woman and embrace how other women lead, how, what they do, how they are, you know, in, which may be completely different than how I lead. Um, but opening up that space, that's really honestly how I healed was through community with other women. And you also said um, that there was this thing in medicine where if you, you know, wear lipstick, you're not a serious scientist. <laughs> I think there's a bigger message there, but I love that. <laughs> okay, I was, I was told in graduate school, if I didn't do it the way he thought I should do it, I was just a housewife with a hobby in my doctoral <laughs> program. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, there's this, there's this dichotomy that if you want to be taken seriously, um, you gotta like look a certain way and you have to, you know, don't, don't, you know, you don't want to look too feminine, but you don't want to look too masculine. And it's so funny because, you know, I have a friend who doesn't wear any makeup and, you know, has super short hair and wears dance goes, I wear heels. And she gets criticized for being not feminine enough. I get criticized for being too feminine. So honestly, I think we should just embrace who we are as women and just do whatever makes us feel most powerful. You know, I, I remember reading these books when I was a junior faculty and it was like, you know, you should wear this suit when you present and you should wear black pumps and don't wear red and all. I mean, it's just crazy. Like the message is like, we don't have enough pressure on us now. We have to follow a script. So I just say, you know, embrace who you are as a woman and leadership and lipstick are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love that. Uh, we have about nine minutes. Everybody, please put in your questions if you have uh, into the Q&A, uh, you can do that. And uh, Chrissy, I wanted to ask you, you're a family marriage uh, therapist. So, you know, everybody's challenged with, with all of this forced togetherness, right? You know, we love, the, we love our kids, we love our partners, our spouses. Um, you know, to a degree, but all of this togetherness. So what are you doing? I saw one of your posts, which was really funny, where you were like ready to strangle your, your, your husband. So a few tips, a few, you know, lessons, how can we all get through this uh, together? Self-care is huge um, because we are all together all the time. Um, we need to be purposeful about spending time away from each other as much as you can. So like if that, for me, that looks like coming downstairs to the guest bedroom and writing or listening to music and journaling. Um, and I'll just, you know, that that's enough time sometimes for me to like recalibrate, um, for my husband, like he needs, we live in San Diego. So I told him we, we had to have like a sit down talk. And I said, you need to go back to the water every morning <laughs> and just spend some time away from us. Like, and that it has been just a game changer for him to make that, uh, you know, instead of he's very type A, he wants to get things done in the morning and start the homeschool. And I just said, 
you have to take care of yourself first because you come back a better person. And when I spend time, you know, whether it's going downstairs and doing yoga or meditation, I'm a better person. So really, you know, taking that time away from each other to take care of ourselves has been the best thing that we can do for our relationship. Um, when it comes to children, that's been a harder one because um, we're home all the time and, and they need so much more of us just the empathy and understanding that they're going to be, their behaviors are going to um, be all out of whack and maybe look poor. And that's exactly what happened today. Our son just kind of lost it over the homeschool and just in tears. And we, I just have to say, we're done today. We're done. Like, I'm not going to make him, he's not going to learn anything right now while he's crying and emotional. And instead of me getting angry at him for not completing the work, I realized that is a symptom of, that could be so much. Like, he's just trying to wrap his brain around what's happening and not seeing his friends anymore and so much change. So instead of getting angry, I chose the empathic route and said, okay, like, we're just going to call it a day and you need some one-on-one, you need some hugs, like you need some comfort. And so I'm, yeah, I think that makes a mental note in my mind to just check in with him later throughout the day and just be like, how you doing in bed? Like what's going on and things like that. So that's, that's what I would have to say about in terms of relationships and navigating all the togetherness. <laughs> I, I would add, you know, something that I really learned in writing Alpha Girls is that um, women can um, take on way too much and not ask for help, actually. I mean, we have these jokes about men not asking for directions, and, but I think women are really reluctant to um, ask for help. It's almost, it's easier. I'll just do it from my, I'll just do it myself. And so you are enabling someone else's kind of underachievements. And I mean, we are collectively where we think we can just do it all and, and um, we need to delegate and we need to, you know, ask that person in our life to, you know, if you're going to do 30%, we'll do at least 100% of that 30%, do it all. So um, we have a question from uh, Stacy Smith. And it's really about finding balance. Like, you know, we're, we all have our sides where you know, you're an extrovert, um, maybe when you're out, but now during this shelter in place time, um, it's very isolating. So how do we kind of, how would you suggest, um, you know, how do you find a balance? How do you make sure that you're, you know, that you're um, not becoming a, a real introvert if you have those tendencies? Like how, when you're sheltering in place, when you're alone so much, when there's so much isolation? It's so interesting. I was speaking to someone the other day about introverts versus the extroverts during this time. And it's really hard for extroverts right now. Um, I think Stacy talked about being an am ambivert. And, and what I would say to anyone, whatever your tendency is, um, I'm someone who really, I love time alone. So some of, some of this is really good, but I also need time out in nature. And I love having conversations with people. So what I would say, no matter where you, you know, wherever you are on the spectrum, and it will be more or less challenging depending on what's happening around you and what's available to you. But really, it's again, going back inward, right? What do I need to feel really good? What do I need to show up as as partner, lover, parent, um, friend, daughter, you know, whatever it is, what, what do I need to do in order to show up? And, and you, the indicator, I think, because the question was about finding middle ground, well, maybe middle ground is, isn't the right combination for you. Maybe the middle ground looks a little bit differently. So again, not trying to have it look a certain way, but really recognizing who am I and what do I need? Now, if I stayed totally introverted and in my house and didn't, I, I wouldn't be able to promote and share what our company is doing. So there's, there's, you know, I have to push myself to go out of that comfort zone because it matters to me, not for someone else or not because I think I should, but because it matters to me. So really getting clear on what what matters to you, what feels good for you, and then what, what's your mission? Where, where are you going? What is it that you're wanting to do personally, professionally, and what do you need to do in order to support that? There's not one right way. And I know that um, 
Stacy, I know you have a mission. So question I'm gonna to pose to Brandy uh, is from Kim Bennett and she says, I love all the authenticity, thank you. Um, in addition to modeling, which is a su in, in a super strong way, authenticity, how do you encourage, um, and, and others, you can jump in here too, but Brandy, I'd like you to take this. How do you encourage your team staff to be authentic, which is a really interesting question. Um, it, it lead by example. You know, I'm the first one to, you know, and I'm a queen of TMI, um, so I do it often. I am the first one to tell people when I'm struggling, and I can't even help it. I, I, I need to get it out of my body, and, and I, you know, I show up to meetings, and I'm like, I'm having a really hard day. My just dropped off my daughter at preschool. She cried hysterically, and I'm having a hard time shaking it off. You know, that was when we could, you know, um, but showing that and then showing the vulnerability of it. And I also don't make any excuses for what I'm actually doing. You know, if, if I'm, if I'm late to a meeting because I was dealing with a meltdown, I say it was because I was dealing with a meltdown. I don't say I was, you know, sorry, I'm late, stuck in traffic. You know, I, I just throw it out there and, and, and that, that gives the my team trust in me and so they feel like they can in return be very open and vulnerable back at me you said a really important word trust you know i i would add add to what you said uh, for kim it's it's creating and this is one of the reasons why i'm so passionate about the work that we do it's creating a culture where people feel safe and they feel that they can show up in all of who they are, whatever their, whatever their background, you know, whatever the um, different aspects that they bring to the table, but creating a place that's safe where people feel trusted and aligning that with the mission of what you're doing, right? Because it's not just about showing it. Sometimes people use authenticity as an excuse to just say stuff that's not really helpful <laughs> and can be mean sometimes. Well, I'm being authentic. But it's really that authenticity of like, this is where I am right now, and this is how I can best show up, and this is how I can be, contribute, and this is what I need, and this is what I have to offer. Um, it's sometimes, depending on the organization, if, if it hasn't started at the beginning, it can take some time to develop that. Sasha, go ahead. Well, I think it's um, one thing I wanted to add was I coach a lot of women professionally. And um, there's a lot of women that are really under a lot of scrutiny right now, because I think a lot of leaders, unfortunately, aren't leading well right now. And I think everyone is kind of on, on edge and raw, which I understand. But I think a lot of that, there's, there's some negative behaviors happening as well. And I think it's really important that you feel like you have maybe two or three people that you can be authentic with and you can share um, because you may be in an environment that isn't super supportive and you don't feel safe to, to be real and who you are at work. And so I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, um, there's a lot of, I think women right now are in a, under a lot of scrutiny in the workplaces, especially if you work in a male dominated field where maybe there's not a lot of women leaders who are showing that vulnerability or there's just, they're just not modeling that behavior. And so I would just um, encourage women to connect with two or three people and share those experiences because it's probably that you're not alone. You're not isolated. You probably feel like you are, but it's really healthy to share those with, people that you feel safe that you can share that with. I think there is a lot of bravery in being vulnerable. And, you know, Sasha, I don't know if it, you know, this, it's like the posts that we share about ourselves on social media, even like you posted where, you know, you were in your scrubs, you didn't have lipstick on, you, you know, <laughs> like, so, but I think there's power in that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I posted a picture of myself on Tuesday morning when I had worked like 27 hours in a row. And um, I thought, 
I don't want to, I, I shouldn't post a picture because I look terrible. My mascara is running. And I thought, no, this is real. Like this is, this is who I am. And this is what, how women are. And it, and I want them to see those pictures. I don't want them to see the airbrushed pictures of me um, because someday they're going to meet me in real life and be like, oh, that's not really what she looks <laughs> like. But, but honestly, like I want women to feel like it's so courageous just to show up as who you are and the stories of you know, that were shared here today and the struggles and the trauma, like that's, and yet look at how successful all of, all of these women are. And we could have just shown that we could have just talked about all of our accomplishments, but that is not what people want to hear. And that's not encouraging to women who are struggling right now. So I'd like to, we just have a minute uh, left and, you know, you all are really extraordinary and you're so relatable and, just sharing your, you know, your, your ups and downs. I feel like we could go on for hours. I'd like each of you to kind of at, end with, um, you know, a parting thought um, as we go forward where we are now in the world and this uncertainty that continues. Um, just, you know, what you, would, what you would offer around that and some either advice or a quote or whatever you want to give. So I guess, um, you know, when, when I think about, well, first I want you all to come over to my house and hang out with me because um, <laughs> you all are amazing. Um, and then I, and I guess the one thing that I'm taking away from this is um, this gave me strength. This meeting today gave me a lot of strength and um, I want to thank you all for that. But I also want to, it re reminds me that we have to go out to our tribe and pull from each other and unite and and keep remembering to do that because it's out there we have that yeah i would be back off that find your tribe online i i mean just like this this gives me so much energy and creativity and support so finding a group online whether it be a facebook group or a program um do something like that for yourself, but also, or, or just zoom with your friends, like pick a night that you guys all get together and support each other and talk about how you feel, talk about your relationship if you can. Um, I did that last week and it was great. We all were like, oh, I'm not the only one that's struggling with this. You know, we all just kind of <laughs> commiserated with how hard it is to be together all the time. But um, another thing is, is stay in the present moment. I mean, that was true before, this COVID-19 pandemic hit us, but it's so true today. Like we cannot go into the future and live there and say, you know, what if this happens? What if the economy doesn't come back up? What if, and I just say, take it day by day and think about what you can do instead of what you can't do. And that's given me so much power is like, okay, today I can do this. And instead of, oh gosh, I can't create that, you know, event that I wanted to create or whatever it is for you. So think about that and focus on what you can do. I, I would say, you know, even before this pandemic, we've, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering in the world. I mean, that's, I, I think the illusion that we can escape that sometimes creates more anxiety than, than necessary. But um, after spending thousands of hours sitting with patients, families, and, and, groups as people are dying and including my own experience with my mom's sudden death 20 years ago I also know that as dark as it is as sad as it is there's unbelievable opportunity for beauty joy love connection and massive growth and so what I would say is when you start to feel really frightened or off balance or in fear, anxiety. If you can just, as, as Chrissy was saying, you'll be in that present moment, take some breaths, just be with you there and ask yourself what might be possible in this? What might be possible in this? For me, for me and my children, for my family, for the world, for my organization, what might be possible? And then it, it shifts, it helps you shift from being in a victim state, um, almost immobile to a, a creative state. And what we, what the world needs right now 
it needs all of us to really show up who we are, not in any perfection, any form of perfection, but to show up and be creative about what we can co-create going forward. So you're not alone. I would just tell everyone, uh, thank you first for Julian. This was incredible. Thank you for putting this amazing thing together. It, it just really inspired me and I, I needed it. <laughs> um, but I, I would tell all of you that are on it, that, you know, you as you are today is enough. And uh, you showing up uh, to, with your, with, to your jobs, to your family, that's enough. Um, and that alone is, is impactful and to give yourself and show yourself so much grace and kindness right now because uh we tend to compare ourselves when we're in times that are difficult and let's just uh remember that what we're doing is enough i love that all of you women are amazing we are going to be signing off but be good to yourself be good to the world around you and we will all get through this. And it's just been a great honor having you extraordinary, amazing, lovely, um, real you know, women panelists. And thank you for all of the attendees for joining us today. We will follow up uh, with the link to where you can donate and some of the contact info for the musicians and that sort of thing. But very honored to be with all of you today. And I hope you got something out of it. I sure did. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.